Pastor Harvey, for exhorting us today to do something that's so important to our lives. It goes back to Easter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who would ever believe in him would never perish. So what if God had never given his son? And it's the same thing for us. When we give, we open up the windows of heaven and we allow God to pour out a blessing upon us. I just want to just welcome you again here to our City Church online experience. And what a glorious day it is because this is Easter. It's my favorite time of the year because without Easter, we would have no hope. My wife said it earlier, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And that's what Easter is all about. Because he rose, we have a future. Despite COVID-19, no matter what pandemic is going on around the world, because he lives, we can face tomorrow with hope that it's not going to always be like this. For as the word says, this too shall pass. We have an ex special experience for you lined up, the power of love. Our team has worked tirelessly. They have brought together an experience that I believe that's going to really usher us into the presence of the Lord. So I want you right now to gather your family and friends around, and I want you to experience the last remaining hours that Jesus lived on this earth before his death, his burial, and then his resurrection. What if Jesus had been born in the 21st century? What if Jesus was a millennial? How would all of that play out in a modern context? That's what the power of love is about. It's an experience, it's modern, but it ushers us into what Jesus experienced in those last remaining hours of his life. I want to pray with you because I want you to experience Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the power of love. We thank you for the cast. We thank you for this moment that we have together. Holy Spirit, reveal to every heart today what you have done because of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of love. Happy Easter, everyone. I'm Jonathan Saraparu, and I am honored to be your storyteller today as we navigate through the most celebrated story of all time. Today, you'll hear many amazing voices performing hugely popular songs in fresh and surprising ways. The power of love follows the final hours of the life of Jesus Christ, shared in the language of today with familiar characters transformed into our modern world. It's a story about friendship, it's a story about sacrifice. It's a story about betrayal, faith, and forgiveness, themes that speak to us all. But ultimately, this story is about the agape love of Jesus Christ. So now, let's come together and sing about the greatest love that mankind has ever known.
The power of love unfolds from the Last Supper to the profound moments of Jesus' death and finally to the glory of his resurrection. With music turning every page of today's story, I encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to invade your home with passion as this incredible auditorium becomes our Jerusalem. Our story begins, Jesus enters Jerusalem accompanied by his 12 disciples. Can words actually change the world? Well, this man's words allow miracles to manifest and they still do today. What was the message that was so inspiring to the disciples? Jesus knew that love, when it is truly expressed, is a force so great that it can move mountains. You have to wonder, if Jesus would walk into our city in 2020, will we really listen to him? Or will we pull out our Instagram filter and will we say, hey Jesus, let me get a selfie? Maybe we'd avoid him, thinking he's a crazy man or a criminal. Well, today we're gonna find out more about who Jesus really is. But now is the time that we're gonna meet some of the characters that we're gonna be following today. There's Peter, one of Jesus' best friends a working class fisherman from a very small village. He's determined, he's loyal, 
but today his loyalty will be deeply tested. And like all great stories, this one has a villain, and his name is Judas. Now, whether you're religious or not, I'm sure you know that name. Like Peter, Judas gave up everything to follow Jesus. However, somewhere in his personal journey, Judas had a very dark turn of heart. And later on, we'll encounter Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Like many politicians, he serves many masters. This will never be more clear than when he renders the final fate of Jesus. And of course, here is Mary, the mother of Jesus, a woman who is about to face the worst thing that could happen to any mother, the loss of her son. She was only a teenager when an angel told her that her child would be called the Son of God. Can you imagine? <laughs> she devoted her life to Jesus, and as he grew up from being a simple carpenter and to a man who performed miracles, she was right there. Now Mary strengthens Jesus with an infinite depth of a mother's love. Yes, the power of a mother's love. As we continue our story, Jesus and his disciples arrive in Jerusalem with high expectations. After three years of traveling and spreading Jesus' message of a new spiritual kingdom, these disciples hope that Jesus will be received in the city as a great religious leader. However, Jesus begins preparing them, especially his close friend Peter, of what's to come, a future that they just don't expect.
So, who do people say that I am? Some people say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Still, some say that you're one of the prophets. Hmm. What about you, Peter? Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, son of the living God. Good for you, Peter. You are a rock, and on this foundation, I will build my church, and nothing, not even death, can overcome. Do not tell anyone about me. For the Son of Man must suffer much. I will be rejected by the elders, and I will be killed. But in three days, I will be raised back to life. No, God, God forbid. This cannot happen to you. Go, just go. You become an obstacle in my way. The thoughts that you think are from God, it's merely just human nature. Sometime later, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the entire city. A crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Hosanna, an exclamation of praise adopted from the Hebrew expression that means save now. They spoke blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They shouted, hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem, look, your king has come. As Jesus and his disciples head for that meal, which the world will know as the Last Supper, elsewhere in Jerusalem, the authorities are conspiring against him. And why? Well, he called out the religious leaders for being hypocrites and for not better serving the needs of their own people. And what disturbs the religious leaders the most in this establishment is that his followers claim that he is the Son of God. A firestorm is brewing because of this. Now, as they head for that meal, Jesus has an important message for his followers.
bread is my body. I would die for you. Repeat this last supper. And when you do, remember me. to what I'm about to say for I tell you that one of you will betray me moments ago Jesus stunned his disciples when he revealed to them that one of them would soon betray him. And I think we all know who that person is. Judas plans to lead authority straight to Jesus. They want to charge him for blasphemy and for rioting and for civil unrest. And Judas sells out his friend and mentor for just $1,000. Now, history portrays Judas as the epitome of evil. Did he do it only for money? Did he become jealous because Jesus confided more in Peter than he did in him? We don't honestly know. But what we do know is that Judas would soon regret his decision. Now, Jesus and his friends are now in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus plans to prepare them for what is to come. 
Now, according to scripture, Jesus is in so much agony that he actually sweats blood. But what sustains Jesus is that his sacrifice isn't for himself, but for all mankind. Now, Mary senses that her son's fate is rapidly unfolding. As Jesus is in the garden contemplating his unpending destiny, his mother Mary feels great sadness for the future of her son. He just won't give up, so she won't give up. And so, we've reached an important moment in our story. Jesus and his disciples have taken refuge in the garden. Jesus is contemplating what is to come as Judas approaches him. Get up. Get up. I'll never leave you, even though all the rest will. Please be with you, teacher. Be quick about it, my friend. What is with a kiss that you betrayed the son of man? 
When the days are cold and the cards are full And the saints we see are all made of gold When your dreams all fail and the ones we hear Are the worst of all and the blood's run still I want to hide the truth Inside. There's nowhere we can hide No matter what we breed We still are made of greed This is my kingdom come This is my kingdom come Sinners crawl So they dug your grave In the masquerade You'll come calling out At the mess you made Don't wanna let you down But I am hell bound Through this is all for you Don't wanna hide the truth No matter what we breed We still Just killed a man Put a gun against his head Pulled my trigger, now he's dead Mama, life had just begun But now I've gone and thrown it all away Mama Moments ago, we saw Jesus being carried away by the authorities. His betrayer Judas has disappeared into the night, and his disciples went into hiding. And his close friend Peter, fearful of arrest, has dodged accusing eyes and denied Jesus three times. Words of Jesus' arrest has spread all over the city. The trial of Jesus is now the talk of the town. 
Now, while many of us, I hope, inspire to be more like Jesus, loving to everyone, honest and courageous, prepared to suffer for our friends and even to die for them, certainly when faced with difficult times, it's easier to just wash your hands in innocence as Pontius Pilate so famously did. Look, there is the man. You know, it was your own people and your chief priests that handed you over to me. It seems you've been misleading your people, that you've been telling them not to pay taxes to the emperor. I've even heard it said that you claim to be a messiah. A king? Tell me. Are you the king of the Jews? You say that I am? Are you the king of the Jews? You say that I am a king. But I was born for this purpose. To deliver truth. And those that follow truth, listen to me. What is truth? The truth is, I have the power to set you free. Every year at Passover, I release one prisoner that the people ask for. You have brought this man to me? Now, I have examined him in your presence, and I cannot find him guilty of any of the things for which he's been accused. There is no reason for this man to be put to death. So I ask you, which prisoner do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, murderer, or, or Jesus, so-called Messiah? It is clear that the people want me to release Barabbas. Set him free. Out from the room, out from the wreckage, can't make the same. Takes this time. We are the children, the last generation. We are the ones they've left behind. And I wonder if we are ever going. Till nothing else remains We don't need another hero We don't need to know the way home All we want is life beyond The life we know Looking for something could rely on There's gotta be something better out there Love and affection Their days are come All else the castles built in the air
So what shall I do with this man called Jesus the Messiah? Silence! I find no reason to condemn this man. Yet a good governor will befriend his people. I will do as you say. Take him away. Jesus has been condemned to death, and Pilate has pronounced his fate. Now, in the modern world, we are horrified when innocent people are put to death, but sadly, it's all too familiar to us. What's happening to Jesus in these moments is beneath humanity, but its suffering is very real. Listen to what they did to him. See, a victim is stretched out on a wooden cross, and seven-inch nails are inserted into the wrist bone. Then his legs are turned sideways and a single spike is hammered into both ankles. Then they raise the cross. Now when Jesus put pressure on the nail in his ankles, he's able to lift himself up just enough to gasp for air. But that causes incredible pain. However, in the end, he won't have enough strength left in his legs nor his arms to lift himself up to breathe. The cause of death was a broken heart. Jesus' suffering was over. His death fulfilled the prophecy of the scriptures. Jesus' faith in his heavenly father gave him strength to sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of all sin. That act, that one act of love was soon to change history. You see, the Romans had heard whispers that Jesus predicted he would raise again after he died. So let me tell you what Pontius Pilate did. He assigned a Roman centurion and a detail of guards to oversee his burial. The body was wrapped in a linen shroud, and then it was placed in an impenetrable tomb. Then they sealed it with the biggest rock that they could find. The guards remained at the tomb around the clock. But three days later, something happened that has been talked about for more than 2,000 years. For millions of us, then and now, what happens next summons feelings of deep faith, a promise fulfilled, and our personal salvation. Now certainly, a scientific approach to these kind of matters says that we should see first and then believe. And that's fair enough for some people. But we do know that Jesus did offer his vision of another world. A world where everyone is treated justly. A world without suffering a world without death, a world without end. That's why many of us, including myself, understand that the power of love inspires another approach. And that approach is that we must first believe and only then can you truly see. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon Him. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever 
were broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? A resurrected king has rendered your defeat. who paid an incredible price for our redemption. On this Easter 2020, in the midst of what is probably the most difficult time in modern history, Jesus and the power of the cross is the same today as it was yesterday, and it will always be. Why? Because a innocent, perfect lamb paid an incredible price to redeem us back to a relationship with a holy God. The Bible records that Jesus actually shed his precious blood in seven different locations along the way. Now, let me just tell you something today on this Easter. There's a reason, there is logic, there is, it, it makes more sense today than ever. However, by faith today, we receive all of the promises that were created for us because the power of the cross. But when the Bible records that seven places Jesus shed his blood, it speaks to us today of perfection. The Bible mentions that, that the word seven is actually recorded 735 times in the Word of God. The foundation of God's Word is based upon the number seven. Think about it today, there are seven days in a week, seven churches of revelation, there are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven deadly sins, seven years, seven years of fat corn, seven years of skinny lamb, seven years of, of cows, 70 weeks of Daniel's seventh day, seven times. The word seven speaks to us of completion and perfection. So we know today that Jesus paid the complete price. It's done once and for all. Can you, in your home today, shout hallelujah and amen? 
think about it today. The book of Leviticus tells us that the priest sacrificed an animal for the forgiveness of sin, and he dipped his finger in the blood and sprinkled the blood in seven places within the tabernacle and the temple. All of this is prophetically speaking of what Jesus would do on the cross. And there were seven specific reasons today that I want you to take comfort. Seven reasons why Jesus shed his blood in those seven places. Listen to this. Number one, Jesus shed his blood in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed in the book of John, and it tells us, or I'm sorry, Luke 22, verse 22, 42 says, Father, if it is in your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why did Jesus shed blood in the garden of Gethsemane? Because he got or won our willpower back. That's right. We can do all things, Paul said, because of the strength that Christ gives to us. Today, if you're saying, I can't make it through this coronavirus season, I can't make it through what I'm going through, let me tell you something. Jesus paid a price in agony to redeem our willpower back. And I want to declare to you today that you, my friend, you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. What else did Jesus do when he shed his blood? The Bible says that he was whipped to break the curse of sickness and disease. Can I declare to you today, even if you have contracted the coronavirus, even today if you are suffering with cancer, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, who his own self he bore our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should not live unto righteousness, but by whose stripes we were healed. Say it today. I am healed because of the blood that Jesus shed in the cross. Number three, Jesus wore the crown of thorns. They beat him and they put a crown of thorns on him. Why? Because this was the place that Jesus broke the curse of poverty. He broke the curse of poverty and released unto us God's abundance. Someone said yesterday as we were, we were uh, in our home, like you, quarantine, and, and, and um, my son said to me, he said, Dad, we have a lot of money. And my wife said, no, we don't have a lot of money. And I thought, well, in the, in the truth, no, we don't. But in God, our Father, we have abundance today. We have riches. Why? Because Jesus in Mark 15, 17 says that they clothed him with purple and they plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Why? So that you today, even during this season, we are victorious. We have all that we need. What else did Jesus do when he shed his blood? Jesus' hands were pierced by the nails they re to restore our total dominion to the works of our hands. Guess what? My hands are blessed today. Psalms 8 verse 6 says this, Thou has made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. How powerful is that? Today, because Jesus endured the cross, we have the authority by our Heavenly Father to walk in abundance and everything that we touch. Now, we can't, we can't touch everyone today, but in our homes, we can lay hands on our kids. We can command the blessing to flow into our lives. Why? Because Jesus shed his blood specifically so that whenever I touch, it is going to prosper. What else did, did Jesus do on the cross today? Well, the Bible says that they took nails and they, they nailed him to the cross on his hands and 
in his feet. What does that speak to us today? That means that I have dominion wherever I walk. Wherever I tread my feet, I have dominion and authority. Psalms chapter 8 verse 6 says this, Thou hast put all things under his feet. So today we can walk in dominion. We can walk in authority. It doesn't mean that we can do it in our own strength, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can walk today with authority and dominion. What else did Jesus do? The sixth thing that Jesus endured was that they thrust a spear into the side of our Lord and Savior. What does that mean? It shows us that he actually died, not because they beat him, not because they put uh, uh, nails in his hands or nails in his feet, but Jesus actually died because of a broken heart. That's right. John 19 verse 34 says this, that the soldier with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out, what? Blood and water. That speaks to us that if today you are suffering with heartbreak, no matter what the tragedy, no matter what the situation may be in your life, can I tell you this? Jesus shed his blood through his broken heart so that you can have a heart that's healed. I can think about the many people who have come one way to the Lord. They have been disenfranchised. They have been disowned. They have been abandoned. And their heart is broken. But Jesus endured that kind of suffering because he doesn't want you to carry a broken heart for the rest of your life. He paid a dear, precious price so that your heart can be healed. Aren't you thankful today that Jesus, the power of love, went to the cross and he did it all so that you can live today with joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can have joy during the most tragic days of your life. Instead of thinking about how difficult life is, think on these things, that Jesus paid an incredible price so that we could have a healthy heart in him. What's the last thing that Jesus did? The seventh thing that Jesus did when he shed his blood was this that Jesus bled on the inside. When he was bruised and he was broken, the Bible says, for our iniquity. What does this mean today? I had someone to write me this week and uh, a number of people because they're all feeling so distraught. And the individuals, uh, actually two or three people wrote me and said, uh, Bishop, this week has been very difficult. It's been more difficult now because I really want to live the overcoming life. But it seems like now that I'm in quarantine and now that I'm, I'm all alone, the enemy is just, just, he's playing with my mind. I want to encourage you today that do not let condemnation have its work in you, but to take promise and to take, take solace in this, that Jesus bled on the inside so that he could break the power of iniquity. What does that mean? That within us, we have this nature, the Bible says, that those of us who are in Christ, we no longer have that nature. We have a new nature. But what did he do? Because he shed his blood on the inside, he gives us this drive today to live the overcoming life overcoming sin. Now listen to me. Do not today, listen, do not confuse temptation with your former inner drive. If you are in Jesus Christ, you cannot sin willfully without there being some kind of what? Some kind of conviction. 
When you were in the world before, you could do whatever and wake up the next day and look forward to doing whatever you wanted to do again. But when you meet Jesus, that inner drive, because he paid a price with his blood, that inner drive now has been dispelled and now we have a new nature and we can overcome sin, not because of our strength, but because of the strength through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Does that mean we'll never be tempted? Does that, does that mean that we'll never be tested or tried? No, all will be tempted. But today, we have this inner drive, this new nature because of the blood that helps us to remind us if we do fall, to get back up because it's the blood of Jesus that brings the grace to live this overcoming life. Seven places Jesus shed his blood so that you can live the overcoming life. Did you just hear what I said? He paid the price. Our strength is not in our own ability. Our strength is in the Lord, and in him we move, we live, and we have our being. So let me ask you this question today. As we have just talked about the cross and the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, have you put your hope have you put your complete, wholeheartedly trusting in the Lord? I was reading this week of the people of Israel in my own personal time, and the Bible makes a, a, an incredible statement that because the people of God who were called to go into the promised land, but because they weren't wholehearted, they were halfway in, halfway out, that the Bible says that God actually kept them from moving forward into their promised land. On this Easter, in the midst of where we are today, we've got to answer the question, have I wholeheartedly, 100% put my complete trust in the Lord? Are you, are you doing that today? Or, or maybe, you have not. I believe today that there are some who are watching who have never, ever called upon the name of the Lord. I want you right where you are in your home to make a decision today. Because of the cross, because of what Jesus paid for, we today can say yes to him, and then we give him permission to do what he does best. He takes us in. He provides for us. He protects us. He watches over us and gives us a brand new life. I believe today there are literally hundreds of people who are watching right now who need to come back to the cross. Listen, any message is preached with more ease than the message of the cross. The devil hates when we talk about Easter. He hates when we talk about the blood because the blood is a sign that he is defeated. And if we allow the blood to cover us and to wash us and to come to our redemption, we are now out of this this bondage of the past and now come full circle to a God who is able and more than willing to save us, to deliver us, and also to heal us. I want right now on this Easter 2020, what times we live in today. I tell you what, I was just sitting here watching the team 
demonstrate their giftings and their talent. What a powerful message that they, they gave to us today. And I thought, Lord, I'm more excited about your kingdom today than I ever have been. I see the glass half full. I see the need today for greater reach to the world because this is the message. The message of the cross, the message of Jesus is more needed today. And I prophesy that America is going to experience an awakening as never before. And boy, have I looked forward to this day. But guess what? I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to let someone else experience it and just sit on the way, on the, on, the, on the sideline and watch everyone else go by and my life continue as it has been. I believe today is your day. I believe today is a day of reckoning. Today is a day where you completely say, Lord, redeem me. Come back into my life and change me forever. Listen, right in your room, right there, right where you are. I don't know if you're in a hospital room. I don't know if you're in your bedroom or your living room, whatever you are. Maybe you're by yourself today. You need to put your trust. You need to call upon the name of the Lord. So would you do that now? Are you ready? I want to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to be very specific. Listen, maybe I can't see you, but the Lord can see you. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows all about you. The Bible says that he knows the number of the hairs on our head. Some of us, that's easy. For others, that's a little more difficult for God. But he knows everything about us. He knows everything. And have you put your hope and your trust in the Lord today? Asking him in. So right now, let your heart be changed. Let your heart be turned towards the Lord. And I want to lead you in this prayer today on Easter 2020. And I want you to mean it. I want you to say it with all of your heart. Say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe today that you are the Son of God that you went to the cross, you died, you were buried, but you rose again. Come in, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and make me a brand new person. And I promise that from this day forward, I'm not looking back. I'm looking forward thanking you for the brand new life that you paid for me with the precious blood that you shed in the garden and on the cross. Come in now. Come into my heart. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Now listen to me. It's one thing I've learned is that when something happens in my life, I've got to tell somebody. The Bible tells us that we overcome by the word of our testimony. So not only do we say it and call upon his name, but we've got to tell somebody else. We've got, we've got, to, we've got to share the good news. And our pastors are right there. As you have said that prayer, they're, they're praying with you. You need to let someone know right now, right there. Say, hey, listen, I got saved today. I asked Jesus in my life. Or, or I'm coming back. Or, or maybe today you are in need of a healing. Whatever your prayer need is right now, our pastors are waiting to pray with you. And what better day than on Easter to get a miracle? He's the Jesus that's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. Come on, right where you are, sing that song with me. Sing, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I Come on, in your living room at the cross, at the cross. thankful for the cross I'm thankful for so much today I said last week that we would begin to hear more good news than bad news is it right yeah and you will continue to hear more good news than bad news and if you have put your trust in the cross and in the blood of Jesus and the redemptive power of the Lord you will hear good news every day for the believer we live from a position of victory not by my strength but in the strength of Jesus Christ and the victory he won on the cross thank you for joining us on this Easter 2020 I pray that this week that the blood of Jesus will cover you that the goodness of the Lord will give you his willpower and that everywhere you go, no matter what you hear this week, no matter what you experience, that you can walk in the authority of Jesus Christ and everything you touch this week will prosper, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. We love you. We thank God for you, and from all of us here, the McManus family, the City Church family, we want to wish you the greatest Easter in the name of Jesus. Hey, thanks for watching the City Church YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this message, take a moment and click the subscribe button. That way you won't miss another message. If you've been blessed in any way by this ministry and you want to partner with us in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can click the link in the description below to give now. Again, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.